So for those who are joining us online, I just want to remind you that next week we will not be meeting because Pansy is having a party and I invite you and encourage you all to go there Aww. and not show up here <laughs> because Aww. there will be no sermon next week. But come back the week after and we'll be right here. <laughs> all right, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to remind you of those passages we've already read. But we're going to mostly be reading out of first, excuse me, Second Peter chapter one, and Matthew chapter ten. So those are the two passages we're reading that are not in your folder. Uh, that are not in there. <laughs> I did not have room to print all this. I'm sorry. It's a full page, and I'm jumping around a bit. So, <laughs> so. The way that I grew up hearing about grace is that the thing that we have to remember is that we are under the law and we have to do our best to do what the Bible tells us to. But, you know, if we, if we mess up from time to time, that's where God's grace is. And I just can't believe that. I don't believe that there is a limit to God's grace. And I don't believe that that's what the Bible teaches. Now, the Bible tells us we should do this or we should do that. But that doesn't limit God's grace. Let me tell you why. Just like it says in James, every good thing is from God. And from Philippians, both the desire and the effort to do good comes from God. These are the gifts of the Spirit. You might know the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5 or in Ephesians 2. This is the heart of our faith. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it says, For by grace you are saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his creative work having been created in Christ for good works that God prepared beforehand so that we can do them. Why does God want us to do good works? He's already set out good things for us to do. All we have to do is do them when we see them ready for us. That is God's will. But do we have to do those things to be saved? Absolutely not. We are saved by grace. God has already called us. If you're sitting here tonight, God has called you and you have answered. You are already saved by his grace. God put in you both the desire and the will to do what's good. God put in you the desire before you knew what it was to be a Christian, before you knew what that word meant. And God does this all over the world. Now, does that mean that we don't have to be Christians to be saved? By no means. Paul, throughout his writings, tells us that because we know Jesus, we can do so much more. Because we know the word and the will of God, we are called to do great things in Jesus. That doesn't mean that no one else is saved. That doesn't mean that no one else is called. And that's what we're seeing here in 2 Peter chapter 1. Starting in verse 3, it says, His divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and godliness. That's the same thing we've heard from Paul and James. Through the rich knowledge of the one who called us and by his own glory and goodness. We don't have to provide those things. God will provide them for us. Through these things, he has bestowed on us his <coughs> precious and most magnificent promises, so that by means of what was promised, you may become partakers of the divine nature. It's not just that God wants to forgive our sins. God doesn't want to forgive our sins and let us go about sinning. God doesn't want to forgive terrible people and let them be terrible people. He wants his children 
to be made in his image. He wants his children to do what's right because that's what he does. When you grow up, when you're a child, don't you say, I want to be just like my parents when I grow up? No. <laughs> no. All right. Maybe that's not as relatable in the LGBT community, but there is someone that you say, I want to be like that when I grow up. You look, you look to those who came before and you say, you know what? That's how I want my life to be. And maybe the only example in your life you have is Jesus. Maybe the only example you have is Paul. And that's okay. Because those are really good examples to live by. Peter tells us we don't have to do that to go to heaven. We don't have to worry that God wants us to be the best human on earth. That God wants us to be... Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi or Mother Teresa. We don't have to achieve those lofty goals. We just have to try. We just have to answer the call. And Peter tells us that through these things, he's bestowed us the most magnificent promises so that we can become partakers in the, in the divine nature after escaping the worldly corruption that is produced by evil desire. God hasn't just produced in us the desire to do good. He has given us everything we need to do it, even destroying our desire to do evil just because we turned towards him. Peter goes on, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Remember, remember how Paul said that is the start? <laughs> through grace, that by grace, through faith, we receive the gift of God and not by works. Here Peter tells us, add to your faith goodness, to goodness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance. Now, I know for me, this is probably as far down the list as I get most days. <laughs> because from here it gets really difficult. Because perseverance by itself is difficult, right? We not only have to have self-control, but we have to do it every day. We have to say to ourselves, today I'm going to take up my cross and follow Jesus. And that is the hardest thing to do one day. But as Christians, we are called to do it every day, if we can. As Peter says here, add to your perseverance godliness. Now, it's important to note that Peter is writing to a Greek church. And what do they think of Jesus? He's the son of God. He's a demigod. And in Greek thinking, demigods are something apart from humanity. Peter shows them, you don't have to be born the Son of God, to become like Jesus. You want to be immortal? You want to live forever? You want to go to heaven? You Greeks? Us Greeks? Here's how you do it. By the way, you're already there because you answered God's call. But do you want to be like your demigod example? Like Jesus? You do these things one by one and add to them and become godly. To godliness, add brotherly love. Once we have that image of Christ in ourselves, once we are taking up our cross every day, we can start to support one another's crosses. We can start to share one another's burdens. And this is the example that Peter is hoping the Greek church he's writing to will take up. And he finally says to your brotherly love, had selfless love. At that point, that selfless love, we have become fully like Christ. And to get there, we have to be not only good people, because to get to that last point where we are taking up our cross and following Christ, we have to bear one another's burdens. 
Peter tells us it's not enough to be a spiritual person at home. You have to say to your brothers and sisters, here, let me help you bear the load. And if you have to, you have to be willing to say, I see that that cross is too heavy for you. Let me take that. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if anyone here can do that. And I don't know that it's necessarily healthy to do that. But I know it's aspirational. That this is what we should be looking to become, a church that sacrifices for one another. Peter says, for if these things are really yours and are continually increasing, they will keep you from becoming ineffective and unproductive in your pursuit of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ more intimately. Peter is calling us to bear one another's burdens, but he's also saying that selfless love is our goal because just as Jesus went to the cross as a martyr, so Christians in the early church aspired to live the example of the martyrs. In Matthew chapter 10, we see Jesus calling his disciples, the apostles that he will send out to do exactly that. And he's giving them a pep talk, and it's a fire and brimstone pep talk, let me tell you. But you shouldn't take it too literally, because it is a pep talk. He tells them, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life because of me will find it. What is it when we start giving our lives for one another? When we start saying, brother, sister, sibling, let me help you bear that load. Aren't we giving our lives for one another? And won't we find our lives when we do that? Won't we find our lives full of joy and happiness and fellowship. Jesus assures his apostles, because this is a heavy standard, if we're to read this as a standard, but it's not. Just as Peter said before that, even before we get there, we're saved. <coughs> he says, to, so Jesus says to his disciples, Whoever then acknowledges me before people, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before people, I will deny him also before my Father in heaven. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Church, we can't be afraid to be vulnerable. And I say this as someone who is often afraid to be vulnerable. But we can't do that and be the church because we have to go out and be open to people and let them bear our burdens as well. Because when they receive us, they are receiving Christ. <clears throat> they are earning their salvation, so to speak. He says, whoever receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Do prophets go to heaven? Whoever receives a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Didn't Abraham go to heaven? Didn't Elijah? And whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, I tell you the truth, he will never lose his reward. They don't have to become disciples of Jesus. They don't have to know that you are a disciple of Jesus. But when you give people the opportunity to be kind, to be better than they are today, to forgive as they were forgiven, you give them the opportunity to accept salvation, to accept their calling from God, even if it's just a little calling. So why do we do these things? 
Why do we pursue virtue? Why do we bear one another's burdens? And why do we, as I was taught from the time I was very young, become baptized? Not because we want to be saved, but because we already are. Because we have been forgiven. Because we, through our sins, crucified our Lord. And he forgave us, every one. Now, I know that's a hard thing to imagine, but imagine it this way. The Romans <coughs> were occupying Israel in the time of Jesus. They were a white imperial power moving into the Middle East, and they crucified Jesus while he was in the garden praying. They crucified him for no fault of his own. They were the police, and they killed a Middle Eastern man of no fault of his own. If there was ever an innocent man, it was Christ Jesus. And don't we still do that today? If our society is still doing what Jesus' society did, do we not have the same blood on our hands? When Peter was preaching to the crowd that crucified Jesus, he told them, you have blood on your hands. And they said to him, what can we do? How can we be saved? And he told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And wouldn't you know that every one of them received the gift of the Holy Spirit. God forgave every one. And God still forgives today on a societal level and on an individual level. And he calls us to be that beacon of hope, to be that beacon that says we can be better as individuals. We can be better as a community. And when we see people struggling that can't bear their own cross, that can't bear their own load, we as a community will step in and help them. Now, I know we're a small church, and that, doesn't, that means we don't have a lot to give to the larger community. But I think that's the kind of community we want to be. And I hope that as we bring people in, they'll see that, and they'll want to join. Because I think that's the kind of community that we need. Amen? Amen.